thank you very much. Um, thank you to Camp Cycle for inviting me. I've had like this epic journey today, uh, cycling around with Robin, showing all the highlights of uh, the infrastructure and the facilities here in Cambridge. Uh, I often joke when I travel with my work, you know, that we don't do bike rides in Copenhagen. We just go from A to B. So like, oh, bike rides are a pain in the ass. But uh, it was a really informative and, and passionate uh, journey that we embarked on today. And, I had a nap afterwards. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about bicycle urbanism uh, by, des by design um, as a way of introduction. Um, yeah, I'm the CEO of Copenhagen's design company, um, and what we do is we advise cities and governments around the world in how to become more bicycle friendly, and that's the short version of what we do. Um, we, we, we work with every aspect of the bicycle as transport in our cities. Uh, policy, planning, infrastructure, the asphalt, you know, uh, communications as well, bicycle strategies for cities. Uh, we do master classes uh, in order to get everybody up to speed and be able to communicate in the same way. Um, we, we publish the Copenhagenized Index of Bicycle Friendly Cities Around the World in order to figure out where cities rank, because this is a thing now. This is what's, what's happening all over the world. The bicycle is back as transport. We're reestablishing it on the urban landscape, so we, we need to be able to measure very many things. Um, the, the invading joke, fair enough, because we did, <laughs> and we were good at it. Um, <laughs> uh, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> and look what we left behind. <laughs> No, but um, the, the ir irony, this is, I can say this in this country, because uh, when, I, when I coined the phrase Copenhagenize um, uh, in 2007, you know, when you coin something nowadays, you Google it and see if anybody had thought about it before, and I was lucky because nobody had, except there was a reference to a military uh, dictionary from like the late 1800s, uh, and the word Copenhagenize was something, it's your fault, basically, you people. Uh, the, the British invaded in, in 1801, or they, with the Navy, they bombed Copenhagen, they came, we were on the wrong side of the, the Napoleonic Wars, so we, I apologize for that. Um, and then they, they came back in 1806 and 7, and they bombed again, and, uh, and at the end of that campaign, uh, the first act of terror between two European countries, it's been called, um, and, and the, the British, who, who sent 30,000 men ashore, and the king said, fine, fine, you got us. He says, yeah, that's cool, but we're going to take your navy, and we're just going to sail it back to Britain. That's like, you know, the reparations for, uh, for losing this battle. And the king's like, excuse me? <laughs> yeah. And so the, the Danish navy, the, one of those powerful in Europe, was just sailed away, and just kind of waved as it sailed <laughs> or, you know, away through the Kattegat and down to the UK. So that became known as Copenhagenizing. And uh, it, was, it became this word. So other countries feared be, being Copenhagenized, the British bombing them into submission and taking their navy. So, so it's, uh, it's, yeah, that was your payback, I guess. For, uh, for the right? So, I mean, we, we, we have an office in Copenhagen. We have offices in Amsterdam, Brussels, Zurich, and Barcelona as well. So this is, this is, uh, this is what, we, uh, what's, what makes us get out of bed every morning. Um, my baseline, you know, every time I travel around the world and people say, oh, but this city, you understand, it's a little bit different. And cities are different, and we have a civic pride. We all think, you know, our, the city we live in, we've chosen to live there, therefore we, we in, in, maybe invent um, uh, or fabricate ideas that makes, oh, this city's different than everybody else, and that's fine. But um, my baseline is that cities are just urban spaces populated by homo sapiens who just have to go from A to B to C and home again. And when we boil that down in our work, that makes our work much more easy because it's just, uh, it's just a, like a template for us uh, within we can, where we can work with. Um, so that's, that's the baseline. There's a lot of special things about Cambridge. There's a lot of special things about Copenhagen, Buenos Aires, wherever you want to go. That's true, but really, this is the, this is the baseline for, for the way that we work. <clears throat> I like to focus on streets. Uh, cities are amazing. I'm a city boy at heart, I can tell you. Um, for 7,000 years, since cities first were formed, <clears throat> streets were really the most democratic spaces in the history of Homo sapiens. Nothing beat the streets for democracy. We did everything in the streets. We transported ourselves back and forth. We bought and sold our goods. We, we met our future partners. We did business. Our children played in the streets. They were an extension of our homes. They were our front rooms, basically, for 7,000 years. Two things happened to change that perception of the democratic space, of the human street. Um, the first thing that happened was that in the late 1800s, early 1900s, this rapid urbanization back then, Engineers were the urban heroes of the day. You know, any, they could tackle any problem that cities could throw at them, and they did an amazing job. Thank you for electricity, for plumbing, you know, for, for sanitation. 
But nobody had a solution to the traffic safety problem that emerged with the invention of the automobile. So engineers were handed the job almost out of desperation. There was nobody else we could turn to back then. And really, almost overnight, the perception of streets for 7,000 years as a democratic space that we all share became rapidly different. We're, the streets were regarded as, 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 as puzzles to be solved with mathematical equations like, like sewers and electricity and whatnot. This is a, a very important uh, paradigm shift in our perception. <clears throat> the other thing that happened was that the automobile industry had a problem. They had these shiny new products that they really wanted to sell, and yet they were despised. This is something that's actually called the anti-automobile age in the 10s and the 1920s of the last century. And, and, and the automobile industry realized that they had to you know, get their game face on. And they had to uh, start using marketing, spin, and good old-fashioned name-calling to change this perception of streets that had, that had been you know, prominent for 7,000 years. Um, in America, they have that word, jaywalking. Fortunately, we don't have any translation in Danish and many other European languages. But they invented the concept, the automobile industry, of jaywalking. A J in the, in the vernacular of the, of, the, of the day was a, a negative term for a country bumpkin. Somebody from, a, from the, you know, a redneck, right? Uh, comes to the big city and doesn't know how to walk down a sidewalk and it's all awkward in the big city. So they, they, they started calling people who cross the street uh, in the middle of the street, a 7,000 year old habit, they started labeling them as jaywalkers. Boy Scouts were enlisted handing out flyers to people, you know, chastising them for this behavior. You know, you have to go up to the corner and cross. And, and it didn't take a lot of time before pedestrians were herded up to the corners to use these newly designed things called crosswalks and wait politely to cross the street. And children were herded into these things called playgrounds that were invented, invented by the automobile industry. These little zoological gardens into which we still throw our children and while well, we're checking Facebook and kind of wait, wee, that looks fun, you know, great. You know, this is this was an invention of the of the automobile industry because the last great bastion. The, the last great challenge they had was the angry mothers. And this is in America, so the angry mothers of America. These, these, I mean, they were kind of tired of, of hundreds of thousands, literally, of children being killed under the wheels of automobiles. You can maybe understand that. And the automobile realized that they have to get past that. So they take the children out of the streets for after 7,000 years, and they, play, and they place them in a little zoological garden. And then, finally, the streets were clear of these squishy, irritating obstacles. And, and the stage was set for really what was the greatest paradigm shift in the history of our cities. And this is something that we live with today. This is something that has been dominant. It really started in the, it took, it took under two decades for them to achieve this goal with marketing spin and name calling. And this is something that we still live with in every city in the world today, even in Denmark, even in the Netherlands. The fact, the, the, the perception of the streets has, has fallen out of the sky together with the automobile, automobile to serve the automobile. And we're still, we're still uh, battling with that. I'm an optimist, so I like, I like to, to chuck some optimism in after that little story. This quote is my favorite quote, and I've been quoting it for a, for a couple of years now. The fact is that automobiles no longer have a place in the big cities of our time. This is a politician who said that. You might expect it was the mayor of some unpronounceable Danish or Dutch town who, uh, who, 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 who quoted this. But it was actually the mayor of Paris for, four, uh, for 12 years until last year, Vuitton Delanois. And this man came into power and he said, you know what, there's a new legacy. You know, the French, they like, you know, the politicians, they like to build, build huge monuments to themselves, you know, very self-important. This guy just sort of walked in and went, Paris could be nicer. You know, I've lived in Paris in the 90s, and, and the transformation of Paris today is it far exceeds anything that you see in, in, in London, absolutely. And this guy just sort of went, let's do this, right? 20,000 bike share bikes, traffic calming, cutting off, uh, you know, access to streets, ripping out expressways along the River Seine and whatnot. And this man really saw his, his legacy. You know, he didn't really care about the legacy. He just said, have a nice Paris. See you later. I'm out. Right? And this is really one of the reasons that we can be optimistic. When people like that say things like this, we know that we are approaching, moving towards another paradigm shift, the paradigm shift perhaps back to the future. Other mayors around the world, he's not alone. The mayor of Bloomberg in New York, he was saying similar things. Oh, the streets aren't, you know, with a New York accent, right? The streets aren't there for cars, they're for people to move around, pedestrians, bikes, and public transport. So mayors in Vancouver, in Montreal, in Buenos Aires, in, in Rio de Janeiro, they're all kind of starting to say this thing. So if, if we need a reason to be optimistic, this is one of them. One of the things we need to do more than ever before is to change the question. And many different questions regarding urban planning and city life. But particularly the question that we have asked of our traffic engineers for 100 years, really, about, yeah, around 100 years, let's say. We've asked them one question, how many cars can we move down the street? An entire education, become a traffic engineer. I've seen, I've looked at it around the world and all the things that they learn, that's great. That's the only question that they're basically 
you know, uh, educated to serve. And um, the question that we are asking in modern cities around the world, and we see this happening now, it's not a theory I have, this is what's happening in modern cities in the 21st century, is hey, how many people can we move down the street? Using all of the forms of transport at our disposal, all these amazing things that we've invented as homo sapiens, how many people can we move? We have urbanization, once again. Um, I'm working in Dublin with the city of Dublin. They have the same issue as, as, as Copenhagen, almost the same numbers. 100,000 people every decade are moving to our cities. You know, like it's, it's an amazing age that we're living in. Far exceeds the late 1800s. The model that I made at the bottom in Photoshop, that actually has 10 times the capacity for moving humans down a street than the model at the top that we just inherited from a previous century without really thinking about it. You know, there, there are a lot, there's a lot of potential for moving humans down streets. So we have to change the question now more than ever. At the moment, it feels like we're all just characters in the film The Matrix, if you've seen that. You know, we have all of this, this, this we're, we're kind of controlled from above. We live in this reality that we accept to be the only one, and we're controlled from, really, from above with all of the people who are uh, designing our sewers, electricity, and our streets. Um, it's all mathematical equations and, and, and models that have been used, many of them unchanged since the 1950s. Uh, if you really look at traffic engineering regarding streets, like there's nothing new. If we still had our education system or our healthcare system based on the 1950 standard, you know, we would all there would be an uproar. We would say that's not good enough. We have we know more about that now. But this is the case. It feels like we're all characters in the Matrix, and we're not even Keanu Reeves. We're just like some of like you know minor characters in the Matrix uh, that are unimportant. I mean, a lot of people don't seem too concerned about it. This is a short history of traffic engineering, kind of like tongue in cheek, but really it's kind of appropriate. For uh, the better part of 7,000 years up on the top left, we prioritized our primary transport forms, pedestrians and horses, maybe carts as well. 1900, 1920s, we were still very rational about it. We were providing a fast A to B for all of our primary transport forms that were important to us. The bicycle had appeared by 1900, still very, very active in our cities in 1920. Uh, trans buses had showed up as well. And then you can see the paradigm shift on the bottom right. From the 1950s, like a tsunami from America washing over our cities all over the world, this intense singular focus on providing the car with a fast A to B at the expense of everybody else who are just trying to move around the city. We've been living with this for 60, 60, 65, almost 70 years, and it is still the standard. This, however, is the, no, there. Yeah, on the right is the easiest traffic guide you'll ever see, the Copenhagenized traffic guide. You prioritize the forms of transport on the left, the three of them there, and you make driving a car difficult, more expensive, a pain in the ass, right? This is the only way that we're going to change transport behavior in our cities. All the campaigns in the world for ride a bike, it's good for you, you know, save a polar bear on your bicycle today, you know, uh, take public transport, it's really, really good for society if you do this. They're completely irrelevant, a massive waste of funding unless we do that fourth line. This is the most difficult transport user group to, to nudge. And you can't even nudge, you have to shove, right? Um, and this is what we're seeing happening all around the world, and there's a lot of evidence to show us uh, that, that this is the way forward. But really, the fourth line is the key to transforming any city on the planet. I call it A to Bism. If you make the bicycle the fastest way from A to B, the weirdest people, think about all the weird people you know, the weirdest people will be seen on bicycles. Um, all we want as homo sapiens is to go fast from A to B. I want to go back to my hotel fast. I want to go to the cafe on that date. I want to pick up my kids from school. I want to go to work. I will choose the fastest A to B. Human beings are like rivers. We'll, f we'll find the quickest route. If you make that the bicycle, you're, on, you're well on your way. If you make it the pogo stick, people will be doing that as well, basically. But of course, we're more interested in uh, you know, more, more efficient transport forms than the pogo stick. We know this for a fact in Copenhagen because every, every two years since 1996, the city of Copenhagen has asked the citizens the same questions. What is your main reason for riding a bicycle in Copenhagen? And every single time, it's really boring after all these years, but it's the same. That's on the right. The majority always say, ah, it's quick. You know, they're not saying, oh my god, it's just an amazing transport form. I just love it. It's not on my side. I love cycling so much. They're going, it's quick. It's funny. It's funny. You know, it's like, man. Fast A to B, it's like, you know, I go anywhere I need to go, it's a bike, man, you know. And um, 
the next the next one is like exercise. As people say, no, oh, I get that 30 minutes a day that I've heard so much about, you know, with my basket and my music and my ear. You know, I, I feel good about myself getting a little bit of exercise. Six percent say, oh, it's inexpensive, you know, uh, and only one percent will say, oh, I'm doing it for environmental reasons, right? Saving the planet. So the 99 percent. In, uh, which is this expression we're now using these days. The 99% are just using an efficient, intelligent transport form. And we're reaping the benefits of them doing that. There is a, we, we, we collect so much data in Denmark. We have so many cost-benefit analyses. We really figure out what the benefits are before we do so. And, uh, and we know that these people just going fast from A to B contribute an enormous amount of money. I'm just thinking if I have that slide later, which I don't. The citizens of Copenhagen today, there's two ways of measuring it. The people who arrive in the city of Copenhagen from other municipalities to go to work or education is 43% arrived by bicycle. The actual citizens, those of us who live in the city of Copenhagen, it's 63% who ride a bicycle. This is, a, this is it's, it's an amazing number. These are not environmental activists. These are just people going, boom, fast A to B, go to the bar, go to school and whatnot. This is really, all these people riding every day, they contribute 233 million euros to the public health in Denmark. It's, sorry, in Copenhagen, the city of Copenhagen, not Denmark. They, it's, it's just like when I ride a bicycle one kilometer, I'm just throwing money back into society just by transporting myself efficiently. They don't know that, these people riding this snowstorm in Copenhagen, they're just provided with the A to B. Those of us who work with this know that this is the massive societal benefits. What we work with is a little bit different than many urban planning companies. So we, we focus a lot on design and human observation first. Anthropology first, and then we let that affect urban planning and later engineering. Um, on the world's busiest cycle track in Copenhagen, this is like, like 40,000 people a day on this one stretch of, uh, of street, the city of Copenhagen noticed that the, a bunch of people were starting to cut across a sidewalk to get to a parallel street. They'd never done this before in the 100 years since this, uh, this, this, this area was landscaped. And the city of Copenhagen said, well, why are they doing that? And they started to look at, at that location. New mobility patterns, they found out, had emerged. We have a new uh, development to the south of the city, so a lot of people were cutting off this busy cycle, cycle track to get around the city center to go to this new development. So that was very important to discover. Um, what, they did, what they did was they made a temporary cycle track painted on the left across the sidewalk. It goes against everything that we have in our Danish traffic standards to put a cycle track across the sidewalk. But the city of Copenhagen looked at these people and said, this is why they're doing it. They're, they're trying to get somewhere else that they've never tried to get to before. They tested it for six months, pilot project, and they said, fine, this is, this is a good thing. So what they did was they actually made it permanent in the photo on the right. We work a lot with desire lines. Desire lines are, are democracy in movement. They are democracy in motion. And, and the citizens of our cities are communicating it with us 24 hours a day. Every fragment of every minute of every day, our citizens are communicating things to us, like secret messages in a bottle about how they want to use our urban space. And we're arrogant to think that we can make them go this way down that street on that detour because, oh, it's safer for them. The people are telling us how they want to use our urban space. So the city of Copenhagen really respects desire lines. It's the most beautiful expression in urban planning. This is like, this is where I desire to go. Um, and, and they legitimized these people's behavior. It's illegal to ride on the sidewalk in Denmark. They legit legitimized it by providing them with infrastructure. And that few hundred people grew to a couple of thousand every single day since they, since they uh, did that retrofit. This is, like, this is how I, you know, some people go bowling. I look at desire lines, basically. This is my hobby. This is my view from a hotel in Halifax in Canada. The common, you know, from the 1700s, this huge park in the heart of the city. And when I was there in my hotel window, like this puppy dog looking at desire lines, it snowed. And uh, I was sitting there watching all of the people cutting across the park. The green lines are the original pathways, you know, from, from you know, Victorian age where you could you know, go for a promenade and whatnot. And uh, nowadays, maybe walk your dog, go for a bit of a run. The red lines were actually where the people were using the park. They were going from the neighborhoods off to the left to the city center on the right. A modern city would watch that, observe, respect the fact that people are doing it, and redesign accordingly. Don't take up the green pathways, but provide this, you know, make pathways on, on, on the red lines. Um, that's what modern cities are doing. They're watching and listening to their citizens. What we've pioneered is, is the Desire Lines analysis, where we will film an intersection for 12 hours, and I uh, completely step over urban planning, and I have anthropologists come in 
and they just sit there and study 12 hours of footage of people uh, using an intersection. We wanted to find out. The goal with us doing this is trying to reinvent the intersection, trying to, trying to, to make it better, prioritizing cyclists and pedestrians and whatnot, trying to think out of the box. Um, but the stuff that we figured out by studying almost, what, 90,000 cyclists uh, in Copenhagen and Amsterdam, it, it, it's, it's been absolutely amazing. Nobody has ever looked at cyclist behavior before on this scale. There's some small scale studies from here and there and you know, back then, 20 years ago, but nobody had ever really, really studied this in detail. Um, so 12 hours of, of intense human observation, 250 hours of, of watching people. There's no computer model in history that can beat that. Just people watching people. Um, we did a, the city of Amsterdam hired us last year to, to study 10 intersections where they have like congestion problems with bikes. And, uh, and we del delivered our findings to them. And they're actually retrofitting them now to, make, to improve the flow based on our findings. So that it's an amazing value uh, by looking at people instead of just punching everything into a computer and generating some models about how things will, if we increase cyclists or if we reduce them, blah, blah, blah. No, people are telling us where they want to go. You have to go to the next level when you're up against the matrix. We've changed, with this analysis, we've changed the conversation in Copenhagen and in Amsterdam, particularly in Copenhagen, because that's where we're from. Even in Copenhagen, we have people saying, oh, those damn cyclists, you know, bloody cyclists breaking the law, my God, you know, rogues of the urban landscape, my God. Nobody has ever been able to provide me with data about how many people actually broke a Danish traffic law. So with our desire line study, after we're studying the people, we started to pull data. We just mined this amazing amount of data out of that. And I've asked the, the very bicycle-friendly transport mayor in Copenhagen and other stakeholders on that level. I've said, so, how many people, uh, how many cyclists break a law? 16,000 cyclists, one intersection, one day, 12 hours, what do you think? And then, hmm, okay, I don't know, 25, 30%, 40? Ah, maybe not 40, maybe 35, you know, they're all like around 25 to 40%. And I'm saying, it's, you know what? It's actually 7%. <laughs> And, and, and just jaws drop, and uh, it, it has really changed our conversation in Copenhagen. 93% are conformists. They abide by the Danish traffic laws, by the book, 12 hours a day, morning rush hour, super intense, afternoon, evening, whatever. 93%. Then we put 6% into this group we call momentumists. If we're going to plan our cities for bicycles, we have to understand the, the psychology of that transport form. The last thing you want to do on a bicycle is stop. <laughs> the last thing you want to do is uh, and get off your saddle and put your foot down, you know? And, uh, and, and understanding this, this transport psychology is incredibly important. So we, we said momentumists. These people are okay. You know, we, we watch them, we study them, so they weren't like blowing past little old ladies who are, you know, falling for their lives. They were actually, it was very, very boring the way that they were bending the Danish traffic laws. And, and, and we found that, you know, we, we legitimized their behavior by calling them momentumists because we saw how they were doing it. It was incredibly important. One percent, you know, just smashed a wall through every Danish traffic law. Blowing through red lights, uh, riding on sidewalks is kind of sacred for us. We just, we just don't like it and we don't do it. So we put them into that box. Everything, like, we had a little category of things that were just like, ah, not good. And most of them were like bike messengers as well. <laughs> as well. <laughs> Same thing everywhere, right? But, um, so really, only 7% and really only 1% were, were a problem. We started noticing things as well. Back to anthropology, the guy in the pedestrian crossing there, right? You, you, we talked about this uh, at dinner with, with Camp Cycle, but it's a red light. Oh, but there's a pedestrian crossing here. So I'll just sort of scoop through the pedestrian and do like the snake through an intersection, right? In order to get, because you have to turn left or whatever. And we started noticing that people um, actually changed their human form. None of us have to be anthropologists to maybe assume that if I'm going to do something illegal, unacceptable to the herd, because we're herd animals, I might cover myself. I might make myself smaller as an animal. You know, like when I'm sad or I'm embarrassed, I'm going to cover my face, right? We, we might assume that people would do that. We noticed the opposite was true, and we were actually stunned. One of us sort of went, wait, there's a pattern. And this guy is a good example. He sort of, uh, sort of rose up out of his bike. We saw people riding along on the cycle tracks with whatever posture they had, right? And as soon as they hit an illegal zone, they kind of made themselves larger to the herd, right? They kind of made themselves more visible. They were, they were incredibly considerate, if you think about it. And we also noticed that they, when we started zooming in, they all had a goofy look on their face. Like nine <laughs> times out of ten. Oh, I'm right, I'm not going to go to work. Oh, God, I hate my job. Oh, I'm in an illegal zone. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and some of them were like, sort of like, scoot. I'm not really cycling. I'm just sort of, you know, <laughs> and whatever. And uh, some of them, you know, and they would like have this goofy look. They wouldn't look at you in the face. They weren't looking at any other, any other of the herd. But they're kind of like, I know, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> Five more meters, it's fine. And then as soon as they hit the legal zone again, boom. 
Um, <laughs> and they went. It was like we're just like stunned by this. So we, we you know, p these people bending the law were incredibly considerate to the to their fellow herd members or their fellow citizens. Um, fascinating uh, discoveries that we made. We're heading into winter now, um, and you know, exploiting winter to design cities and cities better. Is, is something that we're, we're seeing. This is coming out of America, the sneck down. The Americans do this, they invent weird phrases. A neck down is where you have a road and you narrow in the sidewalk at the intersection to make a shorter crossing for, for pedestrians. So the Americans went, yeah, but if there's snow, man, it's a sneck down. It's a hashtag, actually. <laughs> but um, we can see, like in winter, and, and you know, if you get some snow here in the winter, have a look. We can see how much space is not even being used by automobiles. You know, it's, a, it's an excellent whistleblower for urban planning. You can see, uh, you know, the, the blue line on the on the left here, right? That's the actual curve, right? A nice rounded curve designed for automobiles in the 1950s, so cars didn't have to slow down. Never used when the snow falls. So, you know, why not just build out that sidewalk and, and use all of the space that's unused? Um, it reveals the arrogance of space, which is what we call uh, the planning that we've had for about, you know, 60 to 70 years. This is the intersection in front of the Eiffel Tower. Right, I took this photo a couple of years ago, and uh, it's one of the, the most busiest intersections for pedestrians, let alone cyclists, on the planet. I mean, how many tens of millions of people have to go to the Eiffel Tower every year, right? And uh, we look at that, and we slap a filter onto it, and we start to say, right, we divide up all the space. What space is being used by different transport forms? And the red, there's this ocean of red screaming out at us from this, from this, uh, this graphic. And uh, when we start dividing it up, even more, we start to see how many, it's kind of hard to see, there are 23. There are 23 humans using that ocean of red when I took that photo. And there's 26 humans on that pedestrian crossing on the left, kind of clustered on this little island, waiting for permission from the matrix to cross so they can see the damn Eiffel Tower. Um, when you start dividing it up into like the, the vehicles, how, many, how much space is used by the vehicles, again, it's still, it's unchanged. It's the arrogance of space that we have inherited from a previous century a real whistleblower technique. We, I was just speaking in Paris last week, so this is why I have this slide in here to sort of like shove it in their noses. The mayor of Paris said, oh, we're gonna be the most bicycle-friendly city by 2020. So my job last week, for this you know, gathering of architects and urban planners, like, a, nope, <laughs> it's not possible. You people don't understand. Best practice infrastructure, that was my job last week. But this is how we would redesign the intersection based on best practice infrastructure. Um, Improving flow for almost all the traffic users there. Even the motorists, they, they would be unaffected by this. Uh, but it would improve everything for the pedestrians and the cyclists. Not a big problem here in, in many cities in the UK, but this is an extension of the idea of the arrogance of space. In many North American cities, they have car lanes that are wider than Slovenia, right? It's like, <laughs> it's, it's like seriously, you can like sort of text and drive. Oh, wait, okay, better go back. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's obscene. Right? And uh, so I, I was in a hotel in Calgary, in Canada, staring down from the balcony when I was working there for six days, and I'm like, waiting for the truck or the vehicle to fill the entire lane, and it never happened, right? So I just did like a quick Photoshop job. That's the actual car lanes on the top left. I started taking away the space in the middle that was unused. I basically just like, you know, did it in Photoshop. That created a Copenhagen style width cycle track off to the right, you know, off to the side. If you want it on the left, that's fine. It's a one way street. And on, on, it's kind of hard to see on this graphic at the bottom. <clears throat> Everywhere I went in North America and, and many countries in the world, all the space is right there. It's just been allocated in this arrogant, you know, 1950s kind of mentality to, oh, have all the space you need, man. But there's a lot of space for, re, you know, the reallocation of, of, of our urban space, the re-democratization of our urban space. It's not about, oh, cars suck, let's get rid of all the cars. That's not going to happen. It's about, like, just being more democratic about how we allocate our space. I see a lot of stuff when I travel. I see a lot of good stuff. I've seen some good stuff today in Cambridge and maybe some less good stuff in Cambridge. But despite you know, the arrogance of space, despite 100 years of, of best practice, of cycle track design, of the Danes and the Dutch figuring stuff out for 100 years, testing it, you know, and, uh, and, and, and making mistakes and fixing them, I still see, see stuff like this. This is a, from a European capital. I promised never to mention who they were. Uh, but this is an example of like engineers told top down, dude, we need to have bikes. Bikes are a thing now. <laughs> okay. You know, a guy who doesn't ride a bike, who doesn't care, who has to go out and like find space for bikes. Like, you know, just what an irritation. It's like squeezing bicycles into my perfect traffic engineering matrix. 
No, no, it's irritating. No regard for design, the human experience, logic, or safety. You have loads of space off to the left of, the, of these weird bollardy things. Um, this is taking away space from pedestrians, which is not you know, anything that we want to do. It's, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's not a reallocation of space. It's just squeezing people into like existing space and leaving the sacred cow, you know, alone on the left. Um, America has given us perhaps many great things that we have used in our daily lives in, in the history of America. The bicycle infrastructure is not one of them. <laughs> they should just like shut up and leave it alone um, and copy best practice. They have like bicycle cycle tracks or bike lanes. They're not even tracks. Bike lanes on the wrong side of parked cars. You know, putting bicycles in between the door zone and moving traffic. You know, you've never put a pedestrian walkway there, so why would you put bicycles there? Um, on, they have the sharrows. This is like their great contribution is the sharrow. You know, oh, we'll just paint a pictogram. You know, there are American cities who say they have 400 kilometers of bicycle infrastructure because they painted some pictograms, right? <laughs> nothing keeps people safe. Nothing encourages people to ride. So, you know, uh, best, best practice design is a result of several generations of planners and engineers working together in various countries to figure out what the best solutions are. And it's, it's folly to ignore it. It's, it's a copy-paste. I mentioned Ljubljana before I mentioned Slovenia. I made fun of them, right? But one of the great examples is, uh, um, wait, I'm going to see what the next slide is. Oh, it is, it is actually Ljubljana, right. Um, Ljubljana in the 1970s, I was talking about this today, which I'm mentioning now. They, uh, there was a mayor way ahead of every curve that we're working with now, and he sort of went, well, we got 2% on bikes, but we could have more. It's kind of like, makes sense, man. This is like in the late in the 60s, early 70s. So he sent a team of engineers to, uh, at that time, to Copenhagen, and they just went up there and then, you know, I just imagine these sort of like, you know, kind of like Cold War types sort of showing up with their Volga cameras, taking pictures of infrastructure and looking around, you know, suspiciously, <laughs> and then going back to Ljubljana and saying, this is what they do in Copenhagen. <laughs> and then the mayor went, do this Ljubljana, okay. And so they built 40 kilometers of separated infrastructure based on the Copenhagen standard, and they went from 2% on bikes to 10% in one year. Like, by the end of the year, it just went boom. And they stayed at that 10% because they didn't do anything after that. Now they're at 15 because they're, they're, they're starting to get their, their green face on once again. One of the things that we work with is like, why don't we, what if we use basic design principles to plan our cities instead of only relying on traffic engineering, which we've done for 100 years and it's not really working out for us. You know, what if we design bicycle infrastructure like we design everything else, toothbrushes, smartphones, toasters, you name it. You know, designers, they work with the four types of pleasure. If you're a designer designing a product, the four types of pleasure, it sounds really like artsy parts about, you know, uh, physio pleasure, psycho pleasure, socio ideal pleasure. This is like stuff that the designers, the designers use. Designers, you know, uh, contrary to, to engineers, they design for humans. It's a human to human process. The team that made my smartphone, the company, they want to make billions, billions of dollars, right? They want to sell these smartphones to the entire planet. The team of designers, they're going. I want Michael to have a good user experience. You know, I just want, and Michael's daughter who's eight and his dad who's 88, they should just be able to like just sweep happily through the smartphone. And these, this, these designers think about the human at the end of the design process. Man, what about if we just designed our streets based on these principles? I think it would, it would be amazing. You know, the most iconic his, uh, design object in history is the chair. We've been, there's like renderings of the chair from the Neolithic period. We just love like, you know, designing chairs and making models of them. You know, um, what if we design bicycle infrastructure like we design chairs? You know, these are like, we've all seen stuff like this. Oh, it's a shopping trolley, but it's a chair. I see what he was doing there. Okay. Oh, it's an octopus. Oh, how crazy. None of us have these in our living room, right? <laughs> None of you have bought these and, and invite your guests to sit on them, right? Um, you know, comparing bicycle infrastructure to chair design, this is maybe a most British cities. This is the, the, the infrastructure network. You know, you know, the guy's telling us, he's showing us, it technically works. You know, they're telling us, it works, it's fine, you'll be good, sit down on it. But, you know, there's bits and pieces missing out, there's sharp edges, you know, it's not really something I go, none of us have six of these around our dining room table either, you know what I mean? All people want is a chair, right? All we want is a chair, and, you know, when all of you came into this room today, you sort of went, oh, where am I going to sit? Okay, I'm going to sit down, right? And you sat you sat down in the chair. You didn't have to think, huh, I see what he was doing here. Oh, he designed it like that. Hmm. You didn't have to worry about the chair disappearing from under you in the middle of my talk, or, or uh, where's the on-off button, and is it going to work for me if I sit down? You just sat down. It was easy and intuitive, and riding a bicycle and walking in a city can be and should be as easy and intuitive as that. 
It's possible. It exists. Design is powerful. The seductive power of objects can transcend other important issues like price or performance. We all know this. The phones, the, the different products we have in our homes, we probably don't need them, but we've been seduced into believing that we do. I've got the new phone. I've got the new iPhone. Do you need it? No. But look, I, got, I can download it. Really? Do you need it? No. But I've got the new iPhone. It's the number six. Yeah, whatever. You know, um, I'm a Samsung man, so I'm making fun of my iPhone. Too, but <laughs> but um, one, one great example of, uh, is, uh, you know, this kid, he's Felix. This is my son, he's 13. And um, we have, you know, my kids spend about five hours a year in a car. Not because I'm oh, anti-car, I'm just like, we don't have a car and we don't need it in our daily lives. So most of the holiday, holidays, uh, that's when they're in cars. And so they don't have a relationship with the automobile. It's like a kid in the Sahara who's heard about snow but really doesn't know much about it. It's a concept, huh, so it's white and falls from the sky and it's cold, huh, and whatever. I don't get it because so I've never seen it. So we have this Xbox game, car racing, so we're playing that. This is when he was about eight years old. We're playing it, and we're scrolling through all the different car brands. Five minutes? Get out of town. Really? <laughs> so we're, we're scrolling through it, and, uh, and he, uh, he's saying, oh, daddy, cool car. Oh, daddy, cool car. All the cars he was reacting to were cars that you see on the right. Classic cars from the 60s and 70s, really cool cars. And this kid had no idea, so he was reacting positively to cool design. And that, I find that absolutely amazing, a kid with no relationship at all to automobiles. The seductive power of objects transcends also the weather. 75% of Copenhageners cycle all winter because the infrastructure works. The network is in place. It's not bits and pieces of infrastructure, and then you all of a sudden you have to think differently. Where do I go here? It's a complete network, like a road network, like a train network. It works for everybody, and that's a really crappy day to cycle in Copenhagen, but oh, fine, it'll, be, it'll, be, it'll work. Um, They've been seduced by the design to use it. We maintain the cycle tracks in Copenhagen. It is the highest priority. They're pre-salted when snow is coming. It's actually my uh, alarm clock for snow. If it's a cold, like a, a dark winter evening, and I hear the buzzing past my flat, I'll look up and go, is it going to snow? And I'll check the weather and go, it is. So it's, it's, at, it's awesome. The map on the bottom left is the cycle tracks in Copenhagen on street. The map on the right is basically all the cycles, bicycle infrastructure that is prioritized first when it snows. If you design a beautiful thing like a bicycle infrastructure network based on best practice, you take care of it. If you buy a fancy chair worth a lot of money, you take care of it, right? You, this is basically the idea. You eliminate winter as well when you design something well. Good design improves human behavior as well. We know that um, Citizens will react to design. You know, if you see people breaking the law and doing crazy stuff at an intersection on a bike or as a pedestrian, it's probably because we have failed in designing it well. They will react positively to it if it's designed well. You can see rush hour in Copenhagen. You have 100 people in the morning rush hour at every light cycle. Every one and a half minutes is 100 people sort of going, oh, it's green. And they go, right? And very that only the 1% will do anything crazy. So design improves behavior. So before you complain about cyclist behavior, or pedestrian behavior for that matter, or anything, you gotta really think about whether or not you've designed well for them. Everything we need for designing bicycles, for bicycles in a city has been invented. This is the greatest thing, it's all there. There's nothing new. 100 years of, of, of infrastructure. London had Copenhagen style cycle tracks in the 1930s. You have Stevenage with this great Dutch style roundabout with bicycle infrastructure underneath. I mean, everything is already invented. Established best practice. There's only four types of infrastructure for bikes in Denmark. This is what it's been boiled down to with Danish design in 100 years. There's four types. I have the easiest job in the world. I need, we need infrastructure here. Okay, how many cars per day? Okay, great. What's the speed limit for those cars? Fine, number two. Thank you very much, right? It's, send the check to this account, please. <laughs> it's, it's really a super simple thing. Um, and uh, this is sort of the graphic. I just got the five, now I got the three minutes. Oh my God. Um, Bicycle infrastructure behind Copenhagen Central Station is uh, something that we've been working on. Um, I'm going to hop over this because I have no time. Ah, yeah. So infrastructure, there's macro design, the big picture, the networks, and there's also micro design. All the little beautiful details on the urban landscape. Little tiny desire lines. Somebody put in this little ramp in a backyard in Copenhagen. Nobody knows who it was. I went around asking. It's a little curve to get to the bike parking. Somebody just sort of, uh, you know, you would just pop up the curb with your bike. It wasn't really a pain, a pain to do that. And uh, somebody went in and went, bzz, bzz, 
And, and nobody knows who it was. It's just like, and I sat there in the morning watching people coming into work, and they roar into the backyard and they aim for that little ramp. <laughs> right? You know, basically by the people, for the people. This manhole here, this is on a new street in Copenhagen, and it was angled up to the curb as a ramp. And was it the designer of that street, or was it the big, uh, the, you know, the, the guy in his overalls, probably named Yitz or something, with a big beer belly going, hey, there's bike parking over there. Just angle that up, make, you know, let the kids, uh, you know, whatever. I really want it to be Yitz, and I tried to figure out who it was, and I've never found out. But um, a lot of micro design and, and, and design lines along the urban landscape. Um, in Copenhagen, we have like the railings for cyclists here, so they can hold on to the railing or put their foot up at the lights. It has a behavioral advantage because you're not going to say try and try and like sort of roll a bit into the intersection, not wanting to get off your bike. You'll actually just uh, hold on to the railing and pull yourself into motion, or just put your foot up. Spoils the people who ride bicycles. On the footrest, uh, this is a campaign that we did for the city of Copenhagen. Hi, cyclists. Rest your foot here, and thank you for cycling in the city. And they use it in all their campaigns. Hi, cyclists, we're renovating this street. Thank you for cycling in the city. You know, thanking the people who ride a bicycle in the city uh, is very important. We have to listen to the great, I need two more minutes. <laughs> uh, the greatest minds. It's really important. We have a lot of knowledge uh, from 7,000 years, and we know we have a lot of people in Denmark and the Netherlands who've been doing this for a while. We have to listen to the greatest minds at our disposal. Like Lulu Sophia. She's eight now, she's not seven, but she's eight. This is my daughter. And the stuff that I have, if you Google the world's youngest urbanist, you'll come to our blog and you can read about the Lulu. She has a hashtag now, the Lulu. She's, she, I don't talk to her, it's not like, Daddy, let's talk about this. Or asking the childish questions and whatnot. It's just like, she just says stuff. I'm just going, I'm just going to make so much money off of that. <laughs> you know? And um, there's some great examples. One of them is we're walking around our neighborhood. And we're just holding hands like this, and we're waiting to cross the street, waiting for the matrix to give us permission to cross the street. And she just sort of, was, she was quiet, and she just looked around, and, uh, and then she looked up at me, and she said, Daddy, when will my city fit me? <laughs> and it's like, out of the blue, I'm going, whoa, this is awesome. Um, but, whoa, how do I, I have to answer this right. <laughs> the dad. And then I said, hey, you know, grow, look at your brother, you know, eat your vegetables, blah, blah, blah. You're fine, you know. You're, and she just felt incredibly small on the urban landscape. And we can understand that, you know, for kids walking around a city, garbage cans are like basketball hoops, buildings are like the Empire State Building, even if they're six floors. And I said, you'll be fine. And what's happened with that was I started thinking, damn, does my city fit me? You know, do I, when I can ride around certain parts of Copenhagen and feel like, yeah, I am the king of this urban landscape. You know, five meter wide, one way cycle tracks, little narrow car lane for those people across the lakes, you know, in the morning sunlight. I can romanticize it all you want. I do it every day, it's amazing. Then there's parts of Copenhagen where I don't feel like my city fits me. I feel like there's like some weird buildings from the 70s, you know, there's like eight lanes of motorway, and there's, but I still have a nice cycle track, but still like, ugh, I wanna get past this spot. Indeed, most cities in the world, I don't feel like the city fits me. It made me think about the life-size city. This is something that, uh, that we're working with. It's a, it's a concept at the office, like, is this the life-size solution? Does this make little Lulu and Big Michael feel at home, feel like they belong on the urban landscape? And it really is an important way to approach it. I went to Felix, my son, in the third grade, and I said, right, to the class. I said, right, can you redesign the roundabout outside your school that you all use six times a day? Make it safer for bikes and pedestrians and try to get people out of their cars. And I didn't say anything about urban planning. I didn't want to like, you know, pollute their minds. They said, that's your job, right? So do it. You got a week. And the teacher was in on this, of course. And they just went out on site visits and did drawings and divided up into teams, went back to the classroom to discuss. They made a model, which is kind of hard to see, out of like milk cartons of the redesign of the, inter of the intersection. And um, some of the stuff they developed was like amazing. You know, one kid said, why don't we just make cars uglier? <laughs> Nobody will want to use them. Right? <laughs> And, and then they started, they said, well, maximum 15K. And I'm going, how do you know that? Like, why 15K? And I'm going, oh, shit, I don't know. They had no internet access. That was part of the job. They weren't allowed to Google or anything. They were in third grade, but still. Uh, <coughs> and, and, I don't know, it just kind of feels slow. That's the average speed for cyclists in Copenhagen and Amsterdam, 15, 16K. If cars were going that speed, my God, you can all imagine, you know, 10 miles an hour for cars, you know that would rock. That would be amazing for all of us, right? <laughs> Uh, well, they had lots of ideas, like putting a fence in, light signals instead of a roundabout, one-way streets for cars, speed bumps. Everything was basically getting the cars to slow the hell down, right? Um, the funny idea was the bottom, and they, they all agreed, like in unison, let's just have glass roofs. <laughs> so we never ever get wet in the rain or snow, ever. <laughs> you know, and, that's, and, we, and we all agree that that's a good idea. 
Um, but we can free our minds with this logic and rationality, man. These kids can plan Cambridge, Copenhagen, Buenos Aires better than everybody in this room, everybody who works in urban planning, if we actually gave them the job. Think about it, it would cost like ice cream. It would be, it would be, the, cheapest, it would be the cheapest thing we ever did for our city. Glass rooms already exist. You know, in Copenhagen, we have the green wave for cyclists. You ride 20 kilometers per hour, you never put your foot down. That's kind of a glass route that gets you through the city in a, in a hurry. You don't have to stop for red lights if you do that speed. In the Netherlands, they have rain sensors now. In Rotterdam, they just started. They've been testing it. Now they have it um, at their crossings where it's like a bi-directional for bikes and it crosses a road. If it's raining or it's cold, cyclists are prioritized three to four times more often than the people just sitting there in their car with their music on. <laughs> They're warm. It doesn't matter. The, the cyclists are just, it's a tailwind, it's an electronic technological <laughs> tailwind, right? So class rules exist. William of Ockham, I don't know where Ockham is, it's probably near here, it's England, right? <laughs> um, this is the third person, the third great mind that we should listen to. He's the, the man behind the Ockham's razor principle used in mathematics. Simpler explanations are generally better than more complex ones. If you choose the simplest, most rational solution, you probably chose the best one, right? This is the guy who, uh, who, who uses this principle. We use this in our company all the time. We say, right, what's the razor on this job here for this city? Let's apply the razor. It's really, really important. Um, simplicity is the key. So that's the question. What would our streets of our cities look like if our main consultants were five-year-olds, third graders, and 13th century religious guys, right? They would be beautiful, they would work, they would be safer. If this is a thing, if safety is a thing, there's a 9-11 every single month in the European Union in traffic deaths. It's a three, you know, 35,000 people a year in the, in the EU, not even America, they also have that. It would be, they would be safer than any point in the last century. It's important to look at the big picture. We are all focused on certain things, campaigning for cycling, urban planning, I have to do this street, I have to design that. It's important to look at the big picture, the monumental motion. In Denmark we have really, uh, in Copenhagen we have the lamest uh, national kind of monument, it's this little naked green lady on a rock, right? <laughs> a little mermaid staring out to sea, right? I mean, and she's life size. Uh, in 100, for 113 years people have been saying, that's it? <laughs> she's so small. Every language in the world, somebody said, but she's so small. <laughs> About the land we're going, oh, but she's life size, shut up, right? And, uh, you know, but this is really, I think, the greatest monument that we've ever built in Denmark and in the Netherlands, it's not like a specific thing to us, is the bicycle infrastructure network. We're building monuments. We're building monuments to our cities for the next 100, 200 years of transport. And that is important to remember in the big picture. I'll leave you with this quote. Cities are erected on spiritual columns. Like giant mirrors, they reflect the hearts of their residents. If those hearts darken and lose faith, Cities will lose their glamour. This is a 900-year-old quote, and it's more true today than ever before. We're planning for bikes. We're trying to, you know, influence policies. We're doing all, you know, all the things we're doing. But all we have to do is make the hearts of our citizens shine, and the bicycle is one of the best ways to do that. Thank you.